Hi, welcome to this talk about uh, automated uh, Android continuous integration. Um, the title is How Hard Can It Be? So um, if you want to go home, I can tell you it's pretty hard. So the answer is already, it's really shit. How many of you are Android developers here? Okay, so half the room, great. Um, I'm not an Android developer. Um, I, I'm a, a backend developer, a Java backend developer. I work as a consultant uh, for all my career, which is now like something like 15 years. And basically I'm doing what the customer tells me. So that's the reason why um, I was uh, interested in this subject. Um, I'm working for Hybris. Uh, Hybris provides an e-commerce platform based on Java and Spring. We are recruiting and um, it has been bought by SAP, so I should say I work for SAP. SAP is a pretty good employer, by the way. Um, so, about the context. So, let's, I, I won't disclaim the customer, so I, I will call it the customer. I was working for a customer and basically the, the customer was organized at the following. We had a software factory with multiple development teams and one of the team was the mobile development team. So far, so good, it makes sense. At least that what we all thought, that what was written in the charts. The problem is, in, in effect, it was more like that. We had a software factory and there was a mobile development team, but very, very apart. And you know, there, there is a place where we were together, it was a location. We shared the same location. Why was it so? It's very easy, because at some point the customer decided, hmm, we want a mobile app, like everyone wants a mobile app nowadays, so let's create a mobile app. Okay, but when do we want it? So when you ask the business when you want something, the answer is, Yesterday, not now, hey, it's too late. Yesterday, we want it for yesterday, thanks. And of course, we had no time, and when I say we, I mean the organization, the customer had no time to recruit the right profile. Basically, we just had to outsource. Um, we didn't outsource in India. Um, it was a Swiss customer, we outsourced in France, which is like India for Swiss people. We are cheap, we are hardworking, and I'm French, by the way. Um, and the thing is, we outsourced, but we brought the resources on site. The thing is, the people knew themselves, so they already had worked together, they already knew how to work with each other, and we never communicated with them. We just say hello when we passed in the corridor. Basically, they were left to their own devices and they brought the version one of the app. It worked. Um, they even tried to use the same infrastructure as we did, like we used Bamboo for the continuous integration server. So they used Bamboo likewise. And that's at some point, so the, the, ver the version was delivered, the release was made, and <coughs> it was decided, okay, we want outsource as it was, contractually speaking. We will recruit a dev team, a mobile dev team, and we will do the same for maintaining the application. The fact is, when they recruited the people, they all belong to the same company. So this was on. It kept like this. And after a, a while, they the management of the software factory realized it was really bad and there was some reorganization. And as I liked, I had expressed my desire to do mobile Android development. They told me, okay, you will go to the mobile team. I say, great. So the first day was like, how? Oh, I'm a solution architect because at the time I was solution architect, but I want to do development. The guys told me, you know, we don't need no solution architect. Great, first day. Yeah? And um, you won't do development. So 
as a consultant, I still try to improve the situation. So I decided to try to help them do continuous integration. And when I found the situation, as I told you, they used Bamboo because it was a continuous integration server from two years ago that the software factory used. Unfortunately, since time passed, the software factory has changed its infrastructure because Bamboo has one big disadvantage. It's paid. You have to pay for it. So if you have a product that you want, need to pay for and a product that you don't need to pay for like Jenkins, generally speaking, you want to use the not paid version. And so when I discovered the situation, they had Bamboo and many, many, many custom scripts. And so I decided, OK, I will try to migrate to Jenkins, not because just I wanted, but because um, the Bamboo license was to be cut. They didn't want to renew the license. So far, so good. Also, what is interesting is, meanwhile, the software factory had decided to automate everything through Puppet. Who knows about Puppet? OK, three hands. So for the rest, uh, Puppet is an automation of your infrastructure. You know the, the, the trend of infrastructure as code? And Puppet is one of the tools. You can have Chef, you can have Ansible. And basically, you write the state uh, of, um, th that you want. And Puppet, Chef, Ansible, whatever, will try to match the state you, you want with the state of the machine. So it's really great for that. And so I thought, hmm, it will be quite easy because what I will need to do, in effect, I will need to use Puppet to create my jobs and to install the Android SDK. And I will be done. One week, guys. I'm good. One week. I was a fool. I was a complete idiot. But OK. The first thing is, who uses Jenkins already? Uh, nearly everyone. So you ha what you have to understand about Jenkins is there is no central repository for the configuration. In effect, um, the configuration of each, each job that you see into the, the UI is in a XML file, a single XML file stored into a folder. Basically, what Jenkins does is it, it reads this file to, to, to do the, its job. So OK, it works like that. Let's do it. Um, and the guy there, not me, were very smart, but very good. But uh, they should have been more lazy. In fact, what they did is they created jobs with their little hands, analyzed the XML. And this XML is pretty well decoupled into section. And so if you know a little about Puppet, they created a, a, a template for this section of XML, which was um, handled by a Puppet class, like some code that you could configure. So when you use Puppet, you could basically create a job through Puppet by assembling those little classes together. And what basically, it's not we, it's they, because they were really great, but I would have been more lazy again. They, they created a DSL for Jenkins. And this is a fail. Why? But for many reasons. The, the stuff is that it really took them much, much, much time. Uh, I cannot provide the metrics, but it, it was a huge, huge effort. Because you have to analyze the XML, understand how it's read by Jenkins, how it's used by Jenkins, and yeah. So it's trial and error. You have to do a lot of coming and forth. And so it's error prone. Also, never, ever use an implementation internals. You never use the internals of the implementation. When you design Java classes, when you design Java project, you use abstractions, because then you can replace the implementation. And in their case, 
No, they, they really used the config.xml file. So at any point in time now, uh, if Jenkins ships with another way to handle configuration, then all what we have done will have been for nodes. And at the time, I'm not sure, but probably they reinvented the wheel. Because what we found afterwards is that there is something called the Jenkins Job Builder. Anyone knows about the Jenkins Job Builder? OK. Who automates his Jenkins job? And what solution do you use? OK, the, so the API. OK. OK. OK, so I don't know about this solution. What I know is about the Jenkins Job Builder. That is part of OpenStack, so it's, it, it, it got uh, some support. It's also a DSL that is uh, written in YAML, and basically it talks to the Jenkins API. So it's much less fragile. Uh, you don't need to do anything. And uh, now that I have left, I know that they migrated to this kind of stuff. Anyway, this just to tell you about the context, um, because at this point, this is done. So I was very happy. I knew how to do that. Quite easy. One week. The application in itself uses the Android SDK, of course. Um, unfortunately, because there is no other choice now, we use Gradle. And we use Roboelectric, which is a quite a good library to test your application. So the challenge in this case is to make that run on Jenkins. One week. And I found three minor issues, M very minor. Um, the first one is the Gradle wrapper. Uh, basically, when um, you want to run a Jenkins job through Gradle, you have the option of using the Gradle wrapper. Who uses the Gradle wrapper? OK, uh, who knows about the Gradle wrapper? OK, so only the people who use it know it. So let me just tell you about the Gradle wrapper because it's very important. Who uses Gradle? OK, so it's very important if you use Gradle that you use the Gradle wrapper. So first lesson is don't use Gradle. Now, if you have to use Gradle, use the Gradle wrapper. The problem with any build tool is that probably at some point in time, you will lose it. Like if you want to build an application from five years ago, you will have to find the right version of Gradle, of Maven, of whatever, or you are done. So what you want to do is basically you want to commit the build tool at the same time as your project. It's very important because it's the only way that you can rebuild it into the future. And the Gradle wrapper does just that. So it doesn't uh, create the entire build tool to commit into your CVS, but it uh, does uh, just a bootstrap. I will more later. So basically, instead of using Gradle test or Gradle whatever or build, you use Gradlu. And Gradlu is just a script, because Gradle wrapper uh, is just a script that is in the same folder. And by the way, um, the Gradle wrapper was a good, the only one, the only asset of Gradle over Maven. But now, for people who are stuck on Maven and who like Maven like I do, there is a Maven wrapper. And if you are using Maven, just use a Maven wrapper. Anyway, so Gradle wrapper is made of two stuff. Uh, Free, I forgotten the script, but so a, a little jar, a, a little bootstrap jar, a property file, and a script. And basically, what it does, it's very simple. It downloads the real Gradle jar from the internet. So, does someone see where I'm going? No? Okay. So, this is the Gradle wrapper.properties, the default value. Again, anyone has any hint where I'm going? No? OK, 
The problem is a proxy. Because on your machine, you have no problem, right? Probably you already configured the proxy. But um, Gradle, and especially the Gradle wrapper, you have no way to set the proxy. So not one week. I was already at four days and a half there. No problem. We were already using Nexus, but you can have an Artifactory or a simple web server, whatever. You just serve the file. And you update the Gradle wrapper dot properties to point to your own URL inside your company. And you are done. I was still confident. I was very stupid. So this now works. I wanted to get further. I wanted to test. I come on testing the application is part of the build process. So, um, so I try to run this on Jenkins. And I got this kind of error. And the problem is there and there. What is the problem? Proxy, yeah, the proxy again, yeah. So I say, OK, no problem, guys. Gradle load properties are the way. I, I just wanted to, to, to test. I will create a Gradle load properties and set the proxy. And it should work. It should work, right? No, it didn't work. Come on, I set the proxy. I just want the stuff to get downloaded. And now it was not weak, right? I was, it's starting days and weeks were coming. I had to read RoboElectric code. If you know that you have to read the code, it's, it's quite fast. But if you don't know, if you don't know where the error comes from. So people in the front row can probably see it. People in the last row, not so much. But this is the code of the RoboElectric test runner. And the RoboElectric test runner is the runner that is used to use your JUnit Android test. And what it does is it checks if it has a property like it's offline. And if it's offline, it will check dependency into a specific directory. Otherwise, it will use Maven in the code. In the code of the library, it will download stuff. Who uses RoboElectric? No one. You are happy. You have got other problems, though. Um, and yeah, I checked in the POM. There is a dependency on Maven. That's crazy. And yeah, it's really bad. So. Now comes the fun part, Googling. And yeah, because of some architect design decision that I have no clue where it came from, you say, you know, because we cannot uh, provide every version of the Android SDK, because RoboElectric works by basically removing, not using the real SDK, but providing uh, a fake SDK, which is more lightweight than the real SDK, but quite huge. Um, so because we, we cannot provide that, um, then we will uh, just download the, the right version at the right time. So they don't know about using optional dependency or no, no. They will do their stuff quite well. And OK, so how do you fix that? Because the problem is it uses a custom class load. Um, as I told you, what you can do is you can download dependencies beforehand, set the directory, set the offline mode. All of this has to be automated, of course. Or you can use a local proxy on Jenkins that gets authenticated and then forwards through the enterprise proxy. Oh, I thought, hey, come on, guys. I'm a developer. I will override the method. And very easily, I overripped the method. And now I create a new my resolver. 
And this is quite sneaky because then I created the my resolver, so I extend the Maven dependency resolver, and I can even reuse the URL that is set in my build file, in my gradle.build file, build.gradle, sorry. So like 20 lines of code, 20 minutes, and like um, two weeks to find the solution. Then came my manager, said, how much time do you still need? I said, <laughs> now I'm the end. <laughs> you know, done. Um, what was the last issue, remember? The SDK. Because at some point, you probably will need to upgrade the SDK. Or even worse, you will probably need to upgrade a version of any service, like the Google Play service, for example. And this needs to be automated. You need it every time. You don't want to fail your build, go on your Jenkins CI server, then update everything, then no. You want everything. So Android developers, what does this kind of stuff do? Sorry? No. Are you an Android developer? Alf, OK. Uh, you are like me, great. <laughs> Who is a real Android developer here? OK, you. You don't use it. Yeah, exactly. That is what it does. Great, 100 points. It, it launches a GUI. It launches a GUI. Quite easy. But you don't want to launch GUI on, on the server. You want to run into headless mode. Fortunately, the Google engineers are very smart. So you can pass an option to run in non-interactive mode. How much time do you need? Oh, I'm done, nearly done. Then I saw two issues. My friend, the proxy. And the license agreements. You have to accept licenses. And when you're running through the GUI, it's, <laughs> yes, quite easy, right? When you're running in non interactive mode, it's not fun. So first, first issue, the proxy. Again, the Google engineers are quite smart. So when you run update SDK dash dash help, it tells you how to set the proxy host and to set the proxy port. Done. Or what did I forget? Sure. <laughs> so the Google engineers are not so smart after all. They tell you about the proxy, but there is no authentication. Like everyone can, goes, can go through the proxy unauthenticated. And bro's not nice sign. So again, not weeks, months. I was not full time, but still it was not funny. And um, not only are Google engineers quite bad, but people who are posting stuff get referenced by Google, and this is not the truth. Basically, um, I found solution about uh, environment variables that you, you could pass authentication on environment variables. Doesn't work. No, no, no. I have seen uh, answers that there is a specific magic file uh, where you can uh, put uh, authentication. Doesn't work at all. What you can find is, yeah, you have your friend, the local proxy. I, I was so far into the shit that I said, no, guys, no, I, I will do it the right way. Um, and then I found, through Google, I finally found a solution, which is expect. Who knows about expect? Great. Oh, yeah, you? Ah, good. You are much better than I was at the time because I didn't know about it. And basically, expect is a way um, to test binaries in Linux. And basically, you can script the output. You can script, sorry, input regarding what you read on the command line, what you read on the output. 
It's quite easy. Here is a very simple expect script. So you tell that the shebang is expect. You will spawn a new process. Jot is on Mac. It's to use a random number. Air makes it random. One is number of time. Zero is the lower bound. One is a higher bound. And you say expect when it outputs zero, you will write zero. When it says one, you put one. It's very, very simple. Just show you because I was so happy to have found that. Um, oh, sorry, it might be a little. Better? Okay, so you can play with it a little. So very simple, very, very simple. Um, of course, <coughs> this is simple, um, but the real script is a little more complicated. Little, choot choot. Um, the first stuff is you might notice again. Uh, I'm sorry, but it's hard to to, read, uh, to write uh, bigger. You you might notice those kind of placeholder here, 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 and those are puppet uh, parameters. And basically, in the end, this is not in the end. It's in the script, but uh, when you write it, it has to be uh, a puppet template. And Puppet will take care of filling in the placeholders and putting in into the real system. Also, this has, this has the advantage of not putting the user and the password directly into the script, but in Puppet. And in Puppet, you can encrypt it through um, an asymmetric way so that only uh, real people, real, sorry, not real people, but people uh, who are uh, allowed to do that can, can read it. So it, it's a way to protect your data so that not everyone uh, can have a look at that. And here you can see that login, password, workstation, and domain. So this probably means that um, it was a window proxy. And he asks not only for login and password, but for workstation and domain. So I was happy because every time uh, expect will see login, it will input that, password, and the like. Also notice that there is a backslash R, which simulates the enter key, just to send the stuff. Otherwise, if you don't enter, it will get stuck. Um, in the end, also here, you see dash RE, which means regular expression. So it can add anything, any time, any character, but if it ends with Y slash N between uh, square brackets, then it will send yes. And that was very convenient. I was happy because every license agreement ends with this kind of stuff. So I was lucky. Um, what is there to say? Uh, here, you, you see that also very good for debugging, the log file. So at the beginning, you will use it very, very, very much because basically it will fail every time. Um, also, in my first script, that was easy because it was just random on my local machine. Here, I have to set the timeout because I, I have a network a communication. I don't know how much time I will need to do that. So I just say, OK, take whatever time you want, probably it will be the proxy that breaks before. Otherwise, it works. And yeah, the license agreement. And Android update SDK u Done. At this point, I am not kidding, it was months, months. Because the solution is quite easy, but you have to understand the problem first. And that is really, really a big of shit. Uh, sorry, no, I'm not recorded. Um, so, Android's continuous integration, does it work? Yes. It's very time consuming, but it works. But let me tell you guy, it's not mature. It's really hacking over hacking over hacking. Now, 
if I had known all this stuff, what would I have done? Probably, and I advise you to do that, I would have used a local proxy. I would have used a local proxy every time. And then this local proxy would have been authenticated and passed through the enterprise proxy. But at the time, since I didn't know the problem, and in this case, I would say I didn't know the problems, I just thought foolishly that every time I could solve it with normal engineering practices. So this is my journey about Android continuous integration. And uh, I didn't lie to you, it's, it's very hard. It's really, really hard. Um, I don't know why it's so hard. I think that's because we are probably like um, 10 years ago, like the state of Java was. So I'm afraid that, yeah, you will have to use the same technique as 10 years ago, like uh, manual testing. Um, okay, I'm done. Probably there will be a lot of questions. Uh, you can uh, read my blog, which is not about Android, but uh, mainly Java. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, and you can become my friend on LinkedIn if you need to. And if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer it. But remember that I'm not an Android developer. Can you share any insights about the cloud CI systems and uh, solutions like Travis CI or um, Cycle CI or something like that? Also, to be very honest with you, I have no experience with cloud continuous integration. Uh, in my context, it was even not thinkable because customer wanted everything to be hosted on site. Um, I, I've not Android related, but um, I, I am teaching a course at uh, some university right now, and I'm really thinking deeply whether I will use Jenkins or an, a, a Travis. So I, I don't have the answer. Um, really, I, I, I cannot answer that. It's also one of my question right now. Um, I would be very wary to use anything in the cloud regarding Android. It's already complicated when you have the control over everything. What you can do is try an error. Um, either you use my experience or you build your own and then you share it because I would be also happy to, 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 to know more about that. Uh, I have also a question. Uh, how flaky was the solution in overall? Did it work uh, as a clock? Uh, no, it works very well. What I put into place works very well because basically the Gradle wrapper.properties is one shot. Because you create the Gradle wrapper, Gradle wrapper, it creates the Gradle wrapper.properties, you change the URL, you commit it into Git or your any VCS. Once it's done, okay. Second problem: RoboElectric Test Runner. I created my own parent class. I I've overridden the method, so anyone now can use the same class. It works. There is nothing to do. And Android SDK, the expect, works pretty well. We had some problems at some times, but I don't know where it came from. But it, it really it 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 runs quite good. Okay, thanks. But again, the local proxy would have been the best solution. Yeah. Uh, did you try any Jenkins Android plugins? Uh, no. I tried the uh, Jenkins Gradle plugin, but at the time, I, either it escaped my, uh, my attention or it didn't exist, because there is such thing. Uh, yeah, at least last year there was. The whole process was still a bit fucked, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and does it work now? Uh, so, so I cou couldn't get uh, RoboElectric to work at all, but, uh, but I got it to... Do some, some so now you know how to make it work. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. 
I'm happy to have helped someone. Other questions? Okay, so thank you for... Oh. That's up to you to decide. Really, I, I, the problem as I come from, my background is back-end engineer. I really want everything to be automated. I want everything to be tested automatically which doesn't prevent manual testing afterwards. But I want everything to be built at least automatically because that's, that's best practices. That's really what saves you money in the end. Now, given the time that I have passed on this stuff, perhaps, perhaps it would have been cheaper to only uh, test manually. But it's not only about testing manually because Again, this is one shot. And testing is every time there is a new release. So probably at this time, now, we have one money, even if I pass like months on this stuff. Because this is done, this was one shot. And it saved a lot of, no, it doesn't work. OK, I will build it again, you know? It saved a lot of back and forth. So the question is, what is your, what is your scope? What is your delay? Are you uh, trying to create an app and survive for the next year? And probably don't go into this kind of stuff. Or now that you know the solution, perhaps you can go. It's always about return over investment. But if you're already an established company and that you want one app in your portfolio and you don't want to have uh, bugs that might impact your image, then you want to automate as many stuff as possible because you will run it for years and you want to catch failures as quick, fail fast. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Other questions? Or oh, it's time for the party? It's time for the party. Okay, thank you very much, guys.